Welcome everyone to Nepal Safer Schools Learning Week. Good afternoon to the participants from Nepal and South Asia and good evening or morning to the participants joining from different countries. We are very pleased to have you here today. I'm Conscience Reshta, the moderator for today's session. Amy Selmeyer will also be helping me today with the sessions on the technical aspects. Um, thank you for investing your valuable time to share your experience with others. The first in the series of the Learning Week, this session today is on whole school approach to safety, comprehensive school safety, um, comprehensive school safety minimum package in action. The government of Nepal has worked diligently to incorporate the global comprehensive school safety framework into DRR planning for education and schools in Nepal. This framework is also aligned with the sustainable development goals and the Sendai framework. The government's vision and planning for safer schools in Nepal includes the comprehensive school safety minimum package, which directs schools across the country on how to practically plan and implement a set of important steps that help reduce not only safety risks, as well as prepare and respond to disasters. The Nepal Safer Schools project was designed to help schools and governments in Western Nepal fulfill these minimum package indicators. As we all know, the recent disasters in Nepal left many uh, students uh, without access to education. For example, in 2015, where 30, 000, over 30,000 classrooms were destroyed by the earthquake and the floods of 2017, where it left over 40,000 families displaced. These are just the two incidences uh, where children's education was affected for months on end and not to mention the unique and protracted crisis that COVID-19 has recently presented for education in Nepal and around the world. It is important that schools are physically, mentally, and emotionally safe environments for everyone, and also that they're resilient in the face of disasters. As disasters become more frequent and intense, making sure that schools have tools and mechanisms to respond to these situations is the key to keeping children safe and learning. We are very excited to have expert speakers and all our participants today to share examples and views of how to increase uptake and implementation of the CSSMP or the Comprehensive School Safety Minimum Package and generally promote the approach of a whole school safety mindset in schools and local governments. To begin today's session, I'd like to invite Leela Mulukutla, team leader of the Nepal Safer Schools Project, funded by the FCDO, to welcome the participants and set the stage for the Learning Week and today's session. Leela, over to you. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening uh, to all of you. Um, I can't thank you enough for agreeing to participate uh, in this session. We know that we're doing this across time zones. We're doing, some people it's late at night, some people it's early, early in the morning, and you've all given your very valuable time uh, to be a part of this. And for that, I can't say thank you enough. Thank you, Kanchan, for that great introduction. Um, I don't have to add too, too much to that, except to say that NSSP was a very interesting consortium uh, and a partnership between uh, several partners, including, of course, Crown Agents, uh, ANSET, Save the Children International, and, and Arup uh, International. So I think that it was conceptualized to be something that could bring together expertise from across the world to help um, implement the government of Nepal's vision uh, in terms of bringing uh, the whole school safety approach uh, to schools in Western Nepal. I think we can see now that um, it's, the world is facing a lot of challenges, you know, the pandemic COVID-19, yeah, we had an earthquake two days ago in Haiti. Again, we have many, many more extreme weather events that are happening. And these things are posing challenges um, to the safety of our children uh, and to, to their education in general. So I think that it's really, we have to keep all of these things um, in mind as we try to increase the resilience that we have and make sure that kids can stay in schools and communities can remain safe. 
we're all a bit sad that NSSP is ending early and never had the chance to actually scale up in the way that we hoped um, and thought that it could. However, I think it's been a great example of what can happen and the collaboration that can exist between Polycas, SMCs, projects, government, uh, and donors. So it has been a wonderful experience for all of us. And we hope that this kind of work can continue through other projects, through initiatives in the Polycas, through government of Nepal. Um, we're looking forward to a great discussion uh, over the next few hours and next few days. I'd like to end my remarks with a, a very big thank you to our, our supporter, uh, UK Aid. It's been a very, very nice collaboration and partnership over the last uh, three years. And maybe sometime in the future, we can work on something like this again. Oh, back to you, Kanchan. Thank you, Leela, for setting up the context for the Learning Week. And I'm sure we will continue to learn from all of our experiences this week. Uh, we're very excited to have our panelists. Um, before we dive into the panel discussion, we would like to share a short video showing some of our work done under the Nepal Safer Schools project. Amy, would you like to share the video? What makes a school safe? Creating a safer school environment requires a whole school approach, including everything from safer buildings, hazard-free grounds, and practices like emergency drills, to mechanisms to deal with harassment and bullying, and local government contingency plans, detailing how to keep kids safe and continue learning in emergencies. All of these aspects are included in the Government of Nepal's vision for school safety. Part of this vision, the Comprehensive School Safety Minimum Package, outlines 16 key activities under three main pillars that are essential to ensure a safe learning environment for students, faculty, and school communities. Over three years, the Nepal Safer Schools project worked with 52 schools in Acham, Bardia, Joomla, and Sirket to fulfill aspects of the CSSMP and help them view their own schools from a safety lens. As the COVID-19 crisis escalated, the project also helped schools and local governments respond. यो विद्यालय सुरक्षा कार्यक्रम हमरो विद्यालय में भित्रिनु नहीं यहाँ का समुदाय बाल बालिका और को संपूर्ण को अवस्था तय एकदम अगाड़ी बढ़नु रा उन्हीं और ले जोखिम बाढ़ बस नहीं उपाय सिखनु नहीं ठुलो कुरा भाई को मायले बुझे कुछ साथ साथ ये हमले सेनो ये उटा कार्यक्रम चलाएँ गोष्टी जस्तो अवस्था में हमला जोखिम राय को साथ भाने करा अभिभावक विद्यार्थी रा शिक्षक साथी रू साइट को ये उटा गोष्टी चले को थियो त्यो ये गोष्टी ले गर दाने हमरा ये भवन रू बनाऊने रा जोखिम राय का ठाउं और राय कसरी न्यूनी कारण कारण साकिंचा भाने रा सोचने ये उटा बात दे बनायो इधर भी बिपद हमरो ओरी परी रही रही कुछ था जैसे हमरे पिता लेमे मनोसक्षम पिता लेमे 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 प हमरो ग्राउंड को उरी परी खेल मैदान में सांसद ढूंगा थन बनी तो ढूंगा ले पनी त्यह रह का बाल वाली का उलाई विपत्ति जन्ने अथवा विपत्ति का इस्तेमाल उन्हें रू लाई दुर्घटना उन्हें भय बनी जो कि मनुष्य सक्षम हमरो विद्यालय में हमी शिक्षक विद्यार्थी र समुदाय में पनी यो रेट्रोफिटिंग संसंगई हम ही लेपनी हैं, हमरो शिक्षक और को लाई पनी फर्स्ट एड ट्रेनिंग का कुरा आरु और सारा विद्यार्थी और लाई पनी यो हमरो हमरा यो डिजास्टर संघ संबंधित को गति भी दे रहा हूँ संघ लंगर आएगा चुं। Four of the 52 schools are now fully compliant with all 16 requirements, including retrofitting buildings to improve seismic resilience. शुरू शुरू में तो क्या हो यो जस्ट तो लाइट हम लोगों ने था थी है ना अब बाहर जैकेटि� यो असाध्य ये किसी में कुछ नहीं किया बना ले रॉक बंदा बनी और तो स्ट्रोंग दूर ही था पूरा ये जैकेटिंग सिस्टम बैठा जाली के के करेगा ये पूरे ही एकदम ही चाइनीज इसको जो ये समर्थन है जो देखें चाहे ये देखी शक्य पसी इसमें पूर्ण रूप में हिरने 
मंत्र एक किसिम को फरक ढंग ने भो अब तो यह असाध स्ट्रंग होने कि हर एक मं में देखिए Altogether, the project retrofitted 91 classrooms across four project schools and through technical support to four additional schools. To help build local technical expertise, the NSSP trained more than 350 masons, arming them with skills that will contribute to making buildings in their communities safer in the future. As a result, we have a lot of work in the first time. We have a lot of work in the first time. We have a lot of work in the first time. अज सक्षम बनाऊद जस्तों हम कर्मी में एटा चाह भावना के होता भादा खी कसरी हो छिटो करने राो करने एटा सोच हो अब तो भापनी तालीम में मजबूती मेन चाह मजबूती हेन पर्ने रही कर्मी साथी ये एनएसपीएसपी को तालीम ली सके धर कुछ जानकारी होना जिस तालीम चाह लिने पर्द रही By the end of the project, schools had completed vulnerability and capacity assessments, CSSMP orientations, trained teachers, students, and school leaders in disaster risk reduction, and incorporated DRR elements into school improvement plans that will help ensure that school safety improvements are made into the future. विद्यालय में प्राथमिक उपचार को लागे सर्वप्रथम तो दिजना सर में अपने तालिम पायर आमन वालो पहला कहाँ लाने के करने बनी उन्हें बने अलग तो सामग्री हमीसंग सीप भी छि हमें आप शिक्षक विद्यार्थी को आचार संहिता निर्माण कर आचार संहिता हम पुरानों शैली में हमें पैला भी बनाया थे रही फिर तेज पुनः परिमाजन करें व्यवस्था समिति पास कर हमें आचार संहिता निर्माण गये रिद्यालय को वार्षिक योजना अर्थात विद्यालय सुरक्षा योजना पंचवर्षीय योजना में समेत हमें सुरक्षित विद्यालय अर्थात जोखिम न्यूनीकरण करने संबंधी कुछ हमें योजनाम राखे एटा विपद जोखिम न्यूनीकरण को छोटो अवधि को योजना बनाया था तो योजना अंतर्गत का कार्यक्रम संचालन करने वाले विद्यालय सुरक्षा फिर विद्यालय सुधार योजना में समेत राखे हमें अगर बढ़ाया ये कुछ में भी हमारे संस्था ने हमें योगदान दिए थे सब कुछ में सहयोग गयो अब एजी होल हे अब हमला छवटा ब्लक को प्रबलीकरण कर दिखे एवं एकदम जीर्ण भवन थी तो जीर्ण भवन जोखिम धे थी तेस हमें धेरे रिक्वेस्ट ग्यौं रुनर्माण पी अनि अपांगता मैत्री रैंप बने रिंग बने प्रत्येक कक्षा 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 में ये बिजुली बने फैन सब ठाव में बने बाल बालिका सहज सीकाई वातावरण सीखन को सहज वातावरण सीर्जना Thank you, Amy, for sharing that wonderful video. Um, I think that really sets the context of what has been done through the Nepal Safer Schools project. And if there are any questions, do put it in the chat box. Thank you, participants, for introducing yourself. Please continue to introduce yourself in the chat box so we may get to know you. Um, now we're diving into the panel discussion, and we're very pleased to have. Uh, our very experienced uh, panelists on school safety, and they're able to dis join us despite time difference and a very busy schedule. Our broad three questions for the panel discussion are: What are some of the roadblocks to school uh, schools understanding and implementing CSSMP requirements? And what are some of the best practices that we've observed that build capacity to independently implement? And take school safety initiatives forward at the local level. Which elements of the CSSNP require the most support for proper implementation, and how might this be scaled? So these are very important questions for us, and we request the panel panelists to consider these questions as they are sharing their remarks. Uh, Amy, would it be possible to put these questions in the chat box as well? Now I would like to introduce our first panelist today. Uh, our first panelist today is Sabina Joshi, Education Specialist at UNICEF. She has been working with UNICEF for the last 28 years in the field of education, uh, in emergency and school safety. 
Currently, she's the output manager of school safety program and coordinating the UNICEF COVID education response. She also res represents UNICEF as education cluster lead with Save the Children and has managed school zone, schools as Zones of Peace program. She's also coordinated and developed comprehensive school safety implementation guidelines and its dissemination in 14 earthquake districts. For the last four years, she has been working very closely with the government and other stakeholders to provide technical assistance to implement um, and roll out the comprehensive school safety minimum package and its implementation guidelines. Welcome, Sabina, uh, for joining us today. And you know, you really have a very deep experience in the CSSMP. Um, you have you will have seven minutes for your pres. Uh, eight minutes for your presentation and at seven minutes you will hear a tiny gong uh, to let you know that you have one minute remaining. Um, thank you so much. So over to you Sabina. Uh, namaste, good morning, uh, good afternoon, wherever everybody. First of all, my sincere thank you to organizers. Am I audible? Um, yes, Sabina, you're audible, uh, but your screen, we're able to see the preview of your next slide as well. Okay, so I... Is this okay now? Um, now we cannot see a slide, yeah. Oh, maybe somebody else has to help me out then. Uh, sorry for this. Uh, is, it, is it okay now? Um, maybe just a second. Yeah, it's, uh, it might be coming up. I cannot see your uh, slides yet, but... Uh, but it was working before, so maybe you could try again. Uh, maybe I just can give up and you can share it for, for, for me, okay? Okay, So uh, sure. Amy, do you have that? Yeah, thanks, Amy. Now I don't see anything. <laughs> I just see the um, whole slide uh, on my screen. Yeah, so I think your, your slide is up now. Okay. Just let you know when you need to transition. Thanks. Okay. Uh, again, uh, thank you for the little mishap. Uh, uh, my uh, namaste and good afternoon, everybody. Sincere thank you to organizers for providing this opportunity and uh, really uh, taking forward uh, comprehensive school safety minimum package discussion, which I was a little bit overshadowed in the biggest pandemic. And what a time for us to start uh, this discussion when we are having European flood. Uh, our um, Haiti earthquake, um, Afghanistan conflict. So, edu so you can see whole things are going on, uh, and how important for us to really think about in this amidst of all this uh, chaos, uh, learning continuity of children through um, ensuring that safe uh, school protocol, school safety. Next slide, please. Hello. Next yeah, slide. Can see the next slide, Sabina. But somehow I don't see. Well, sorry, I think there is a little bit uh, mishap on my computer lab. So uh, the next slide, I think it's a comprehensive school safety um, overall picture, which I didn't have to provide you much. The whole Nepal's comprehensive school safety uh, um, uh, movement is uh, depend on the uh, the structural uh, overarching framework uh, provided by UN uh, United. States Office of Disaster Experience and uh, Global Alliance of DRR and Resilience. Uh, and I would like to go quickly on the third slide. Uh, the, the third slide is on uh, what are is there? Uh, your video already provided the overall picture of how the comprehensive safety minimum package is really implemented at the field of today. World. And on behalf of the education cluster Koli, who has been supporting government to um, uh, uh, coordinate uh, to develop the comprehensive school safety minimum package as well as comprehensive school safety implementation guideline, which is the toolkit for the school level uh, and local government level uh, stakeholders to uh, implement uh, comprehensive school safety minimum package. It uh, actually the whole idea about this uh, comprehensive school safety minimum package is to, uh, I think we can go to the next slide. Uh, to uh, ensure the institutional arrangement for safe schools. So we apply one, two, three, four uh, uh, principle. The school disaster management committee has to be there. In the past, uh, we used to have a school management committee, but there is not a specific uh, uh, 
uh, um, a committee for school disaster management, which look into the vulnerability risk analysis, risk assessment of the school. And the focal teachers also were there on and off uh, thing, but this comprehensive school safety minimum package have ensured that there are two uh, teachers provision is there. So one is school safety, CSS focal teacher, another is gender equity, social inclusion. So that other aspect of uh, school safety that is related to violence, uh, child protection, conflict also can be covered. Three task forces are there and action uh, plan. So task force are aimed to build a behavioral uh, uh, practice uh, that that is uh, school children should be practicing for school safety. So we have search and rescue task force, information coordination task force, first aid task force, and the action plan is a you can see a four action plans. It looks like a different action plan, but these are the different component of school uh, disaster management plan that includes a risk reduction plan. A child protection s job which uh, in the previous video was also explained education continuity action plan which is very very relevant at this point when the pandemic is happening and preparedness and response plan so the, the good practices i would quickly go through based on that what we have seen that the discussion has really triggered at the federal and provincial level our new um, school sector plan has uh, has um, actually based on the uh, risks and vulnerability analysis which was not the case in the last thing uh, as a uh, school sector project has explained this has been a greater buy-in by the um, partners so this has been implemented through so many partners which itself is a thing and uh, for the local level i think uh, school implement plan which has engrossed the school disaster management uh, part uh, is integrated in the local disaster and uh, uh, climate resilience plan this plan has served as a very uh, uh, useful resources for the local pilot class to prioritize tools another uh, it's a local curriculum development practice has been increased and improved preparedness is there at the school level I think uh, having all this arrangement, institutional arrangements that I mentioned earlier, has uh, steered a dialogue process between school communities, school members, different teachers, students, uh, and development of the school disaster management plan. Uh, dialogue between school and community has started. In uh, that's what we have seen in the program, just especially uh, it has greatly reduced the impact of monsoon when the discussion happened in the flood affected areas, the landfill um, school area has been uh, early action has been taken to protect uh, early grade classrooms, uh, materials, and children itself being engaged in this process with, through different activities, child club members, uh, quiz context, different activities, uh, school mela, I think small fun fair, they have been a, ch a change agent and taking this information to the uh, their family and uh, community. So next slide, please. Uh, the gaps and challenges, I would say in the more uh, three areas, I have written some here, but the most important uh, gap is the, we have uh, this uh, continuous exposure of different hazards. Uh, also, we have a uh, technical know-how uh, capacity at the local level and how should we work on that and social economic uh, uh, vulnerability is there. Specifically, I would like to mention the uh, bold uh, lines that a strategic action plan, although we have developed a uh, comprehensive school safety development plan, our strategic plan is yet to be formed. And uh, so that, that is the lag there. Uh, uh, Education information management system has just recently introduced the um, um, come of information uh, from EMIS, but this information is still lacking at province and local level for the uh, greater implementation. Uh, vulnerability schools has to be assessed. Uh, that is a gap. And I think when I mentioned three pillars that it has the three dimension because the first pillar safe school learning school has the more technical aspect second pillar has the more systemic and uh, systemic and behavioral aspect then the third pillar has more pedagogical in terms of risk education how do we bring these two uh, uh, pillars actors in one place is also really a, a challenge uh, technical capacity i have mentioned i think uh, the field observation when we talk about the implementers at the field and local level i think there has to be some kind of uniformity understanding which is lacking uh, and where these schools uh, so 16 indicators are going down they have been doing that but this information is not uh, right across the same uh, all so there we need the standardized message on preparedness 
Uh, again, um, there is more focus on pillar one. Everybody wants a good school, good school building, but then how it can be maintained, repair, maintenance, how can it, you know, that is there. Retrofitting, glad that through this project we have introduced retrofitting and maybe, and also the, our was um, our flood response uh, in Tarai district has also um, highlighted, promoted repair, maintenance, then, then the new structure, because it also saves a lot of uh, education investment. Uh, when we discuss about the different uh, this intervention uh, institution arrangement, it is difficult for a small school to uh, apply. Uh, I think another I like highlighted in red because climate change is coming so strongly, uh, and but integration of climate uh, change adaptation and mitigation uh, issues are yet to be uh, implemented at policy level. Similarly, at the local level, which is really. Um, 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 I think hunting us. And the for way forward achieving national wide school safety, I would say strengthening linkages. Similarly, because now we have a three level of uh, government. So this linkage is required at all level, federal, provincial, and local level. Uh, strategy for capacity building training. Now, uh, local government are the custodian of education, uh, school education. So there uh, from the local government level also, this has to be strengthened. Uh, and at the federal level also to oversee it. Targeting, we cannot reach all the school at the time. Phase-wise approach has to be there. Uh, and uh, moreover, we have been mentioning about 16 uh, indicators. How would we want to monitoring that? So that m &E mechanism has to be established. Uh, I think one of the uh, um, area where how can we build school resilience, uh, education resilience is engagement with uh, networking uh, partners. So uh, like SMC Federation, uh, um, um, AIN, our uh, own uh, National Association Municipality, especially um, uh, governing bodies, uh, networking, I think we have to have a continuous discussion. One area where we are really not having a concrete dialogue is engagement with private schools. If you look at the vulnerability, I think private schools are more vulnerable because we don't have a set of standard for their school building, everything, how to engage with them. And update review uh, this uh, implementation guideline or CSSMP in, as per the uh, pandemic context. That is important. So I would quickly like to pause here and also want to give a message that uh, we have been doing a lot in um, uh, school buildings, uh, safe school construction, and creating enabling working environment. But are children learning? I think that is the biggest question we have to understand. With all this effort, if children are not, not learning, then something we also have to um, keep equally focused on and see that not only good school building ensure uh, children's learning, it really definitely saves uh, and it gives a con conducive working environment, but learning part also has to be equally strengthened side by side with comprehensive school safety minimum package. So over to you, Panchana ji. Thank, thank you, Sabina. Thank you very much for um, highlighting some of the you know, the overview of the CSSMP, as well as the most importantly, the gaps and challenges. Um, I think interesting points that you highlighted was also that there's definitely, that you've definitely seen increased awareness and commitment by different stakeholders and that they're also becoming change agents. Um, the foundations for safer schools included uh, the three pillars uh, as well, but then the lack of how do these three pillars uh, interact with education, um, interact with each other, particularly the infrastructure, the management and the education together, how do they interact with each other is one of the challenges among many, as well as reviewing and monitoring of the indicators and also bringing private sector on board. I think just the key highlights there, but you definitely listed, I think, a very comprehensive, broad overview of what are some of the gaps and challenges for safer schools in Nepal, which was great and I think sets a great context for our next speaker. Uh, I would like to request the participants to continue to put their questions on the chat box and we'll get to them at the end of the three presentations. Also, please do introduce yourself if you haven't done so already. Now I would like to invite our um, next speaker and thank you Rebecca for joining. I think um, it's uh, a little bit of a time difference for you. Uh, our second speaker, Dr. Rebecca Pachi Green is an associate professor and the chair of environmental studies at Western Washington University. She teaches courses in natural hazards 
planning and disaster risk reduction, and he has researched and written about comprehensive school safety for over a decade. She has academic training in both structural engineering and cultural anthropology. In 2019, she was a Fulbright senior scholar to Nepal as well. Rebecca, again, you have eight minutes to reflect on the questions and to share your experience. Um, it would be great uh, to hear you, particularly given your background. Thank you, Rebecca, over to you. Uh, thank you. First, I wanna check that everyone can hear me. Yes, we can hear you and I can see a slide as well. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I really appreciate uh, Sabina Ji's uh, first presentation and focusing um, on what is happening in Nepal. Um, I'm going to provide a global context uh, for this, which is a really nice um, comparison. And I took a different approach, um, perhaps just out of my own ignorance. But uh, what I'm going to do is um, set a global stage for what's going on with comprehensive school safety and where we stand. Uh, and then in terms of answering the questions related to this panel, um, I have lots of thoughts and comments, uh, but um, I assume that we're going to delve into those more deeply uh, in the discussion section and question and answer. So next slide, please. So like everyone else, uh, we are all familiar with comprehensive school safety. This safe, uh, this framework uh, began and well was uh, initially um, conceptualized in about 2007 and first adopted in Southeast Asia in about 2012. Uh, it has been updated in 2017. And if you are unaware, it is in the process uh, internally uh, in Godress through UNDRR, uh, uh, going through a second uh, update. And very soon, um, many of you will be asked to uh, think through and help review uh, and um, adapt this framework even further. One of the big things that's coming forward right now uh, in thinking about this goal safety framework is bringing in um, uh, education in emergencies and ensuring that we're also bringing in all of the conflict zone and uh, education in emergency context that has operated um, somewhat in parallel up until this point. Uh, but looking at comprehensive school safety, we have those three pillars. And I want to just emphasize that all of this is based on two very fundamental human rights, uh, the right of children uh, to survival and the right to access education. And as Sabina G mentioned, it isn't so much about accessing a safe school building, but accessing good quality education. And we need to remind ourselves about that because we do often get really focused on the building only. Next slide. So in 2017, uh, I was part of a global baseline survey that looked at comprehensive school safety policy uh, in um, many countries across the world, including eight SARC countries, and Nepal was uh, part of that assessment. And um, in this just uh, global context uh, position, I want to um, share some of what we were finding there. I will say that the global findings were replicated uh, very almost um, step by step in SARC countries and in Nepal, um, where there were strengths globally, there were strengths in the SARC countries, uh, where there were weaknesses. Um, there were weaknesses in the SARC countries. Next slide, please. Uh, so starting with policy coverage and activities in uh, pillar one, safe learning facilities, uh, click, I forgot that this is, time synced. So there were some relative strengths around um, policies to select safe school sites. About 66% of the countries have uh, safe uh, school site selection processes, or at least guidance to schools um, uh, uh, around uh, safe school uh, selection of sites. Uh, there was also um, even a higher level of hazard informed design and construction. Um, and Nepal is a, an example of that uh, recently developing 
especially post 2015 Gorka earthquake, um, uh, construction site, uh, school construction design and construction guidelines uh, that took into account uh, hazard risk, especially that of earthquakes. Uh, less school, uh, less countries had um, effective school construction monitoring. Almost all countries say that they have. I'd say you know a good two thirds of the countries say they have uh, policy coverage around school construction monitoring. Um, but in Nepal, as elsewhere, oftentimes that uh, monitoring is on paper only or is very limited with a few checks, um, perhaps even only a field check at the completion stage uh, when mistakes have already been made and perhaps covered up uh, in the construction process and lack uh, a robust continuous monitoring uh, that we know is critical for ensuring that schools actually are built uh, with uh, risk reduction techniques um, and done so. And where they are done, it's an amazingly effective strategy. I'm showing you a picture uh, of a school that um, the right hand school block was retrofitted. Um, uh, prior to the Gorka earthquake, but they didn't have sufficient funds, so they didn't do the kindergarten block, is, which is what you see on the left. Uh, same earthquake, same site. Um, and when we went and assessed the school, the it was rag, red tagged for the kindergarten block on the left, and there was not even a single crack or even any indication. Uh, that an earthquake had occurred in the retrofitted block on the right, even though this was rubble stone uh, construction, which is by far the most difficult uh, construction to retrofit. Um, in terms of weaknesses, there, uh, there are policy weaknesses. Um, as Sabina G mentioned, risk assessment is um, really, really lacking globally and in Nepal. Where are uh, the hazards, where is the exposure? Um, and funding for retrofitting is abysmal uh, globally. Um, Crown Agent and UK Aid um, is helping to fill some of that gap um, when the, with the NSSP project and as well as other uh, donors and multilateral uh, aid. Uh, but this is really, really um, where the big uh, financial gap is. Uh, and then there's also a gap in policies limiting schools as shelters. This is particularly problematic uh, in cyclone affected areas where um, schools wind up very frequently, in fact, becoming temporary shelters for communities in a way that uh, puts children at risk because um, they, uh, the, uh, their education is disrupted and oftentimes there are community members and families uh, in their school blocks, oftentimes for months or years. Um, and uh, it does not create a sort of a, um, a clear security um, environment for the students. Okay, next slide. Uh, in terms of pillar two, strength is like Nepal. Many, many countries now have risk reduction or disaster management plans. Um, very, uh, a much lower number have mandated fire drills, um, but still it's a, a relative strength. Next. Relative weakness, uh, and we see this across countries, is that where things are mandated, such as fire drills or earthquake drills, um, often guidance lags behind the mandate. So it's required uh, to have an earthquake drill, but there isn't sufficient guidance or training for teachers in how to do those earthquake drills or how to do those fire drills. And when teachers and principals are left to their own uh, knowledge and devices about what it means to do a fire drill or an earthquake drill or an evacuation, um, all kinds of bad practices uh, tend to creep in. We need to support what is mandated. Next slide. And lastly, we have um, pillar three, disaster 
reduction in resilience education, relative strengths, and I would put Nepal as one of the outstanding exemplars uh, globally um, is uh, public awareness campaigns. Um, Earthquake Safety Day is one of those in Nepal. Um, and also DRR integration into national curriculum um, is beginning to happen in, in about 65% of the countries. Next slide. Uh, the relative weakness here is much like with the drills. Um, when curriculum is introduced at the national level or at the local um, um, district or uh, provincial level, oftentimes teachers aren't trained in how to do that curriculum. And so they're left um, doing an ad hoc approach to these new curricular elements. And this can be highly problematic in terms of what uh, students actually learn. And with that, I will uh, hand it back over and I look forward to a discussion around the questions about roadblocks, successes, and how to scale. Thank you so much, Rebecca, for presenting it very succinctly on the um, on the successes or, you know, the progress that the Nepal is making and where we stand globally, but also some of the gaps. I think it was very interesting that both you and uh, Sabina noted about the risk assessment. Um, you know, there's a strong, there's a big gap in understanding vulnerabilities of the sites as well as social vulnerabilities. And also to note your point is how schools are used as shelters during disasters and how that affects the long-term education of the children. Um, you also mentioned about retrofitting, so we'll be talking about that tomorrow in the next session of the learning week, so please go and join us then as well. And you also highlighted how guidance um, and, uh, you know, uh, actually practical know-how at the local level can hinder some of the plans and strategies that are in place. So thank you so much for Rebecca, uh, for that, Rebecca, uh, Dr. Pachi Green. We really enjoyed your presentation. Now moving on to our next speaker, I just wanted to note um, to our participants to put their questions and comments in the chat box and we'll be getting to them at the end of the third speaker. Uh, our third speaker, we're very fortunate to have her with us, uh, Jyoti Ranamagar for her remarks. Uh, she has been working in the emergency situation and education since 2003. She's a program manager with World Education and has led emergency education efforts, including most recently, to, uh, recently the Safe to Learn initiative in 500 schools and is an education cluster member of World Education. We'd like to hear your experience and reflection on what has been shared by our previous speakers um, on particularly around the challenges and best practices for CSSMP. Um, over to you, Jyoti. Good afternoon for everybody. <clears throat> Sorry, I don't have any presentation. I just have to note down the uh, points as given uh, questions. So I try my best to uh, uh, like to present my uh, some comments and points. Uh, as we already that our two presenter and even Sabinaji also has uh, uh, said like that comprehensive safety school master plan is a, as a holistic approach, you know, and so uh, in our uh, in our experience uh, and last our safe to learn to school, uh, we just uh, finished that one and we uh, have a chance to uh, some of the things to observe and experience on that project as well. So CSS master plan is still the date till the uh, till that date and uh, it's not uh, disseminated disseminated in all over the schools and all over the palikas in nepal uh, even we have some uh, orientation to the palikas and local level and in that orientation only the few uh, people uh, know about this css master plan but only they knew uh, they also know about only the few uh, maybe the cover uh, cover of the book, CSS Master Plan, that uh, cover book, or some of the little bit of content and little bit of that pillars, only only that. So uh, 
And we found on that, uh, so that is, uh, we need to be more uh, scale of that things in our more schools and palikas, but uh, I heard that uh, UNICEF is going to that in like a uh, uh, cluster of rows, uh, uh, as Sabine, as you mentioned in that. So, and uh, even though the, uh, even though other, other hand is like, even the CSS master plan has basically people know about that uh, infrastructure building and retrofits and other things. But at the same time, we are some of the only the few people uh, uh, like talking about the protection issues like uh, children, uh, school adjunct of peace and the protection issue. Even the school buildings are very safe, uh, very um, in a uh, reconstruction or retrofit, but in in their situation, like protection is if, even that there is a, a school management committee and then teachers they have a fight between and discrimination in the lower lower caste and even the uh, harassment like the if in high school that the boys was teasing a, a t, uh, like uh, teachers you know the female teachers so there is a a crumb across the so many issues in protection aspect in the schools as for uh, uh, safety. So uh, we also a uh, little bit, uh, uh, I think is a uh, <clears throat> gap in that, that uh, sense in school uh, protection issues as well. Uh, so that is the first question of my, uh, we experience and uh, we, uh, we have to done in that our previous project, we have to find out that uh, things a little bit. And then <clears throat> next one is like, a, uh, best practices is like uh, best practices what we done uh, in our previous year and previous programs like one is is a coalition approach you know there is a lot of organization involving in that coalition so that they can uh, hand hand in hand together to uh, self to, uh, to to protect the children to protect the schools and also the talking about the safety of the buildings and other things so that approach is a very best things to we found in the coalition approach because in that coalition is a difference organization cbos and local level um, local level bodies school teacher school management committee so they all are involved in that coalition so that is the one uh, best things to do uh, we can uh, we can to protect the schools and children in that uh, in that approach as well so another one is like uh, Another, another one is like uh, even that uh, uh, CSS master plan is a very vague documents, you know, if we see that is a very technical terms inside that in Nepal, we have translated to, to it English to Nepali is so much of big, uh, you know, meaning. So we have to first to develop is a very simplified version to the audience, our target group, you know, so that's why they understand what uh, what really points what are the points in including in that our css master plan so after that they understand that and they have to uh, take action and initiate it you know to do the uh, how to they save to school and protect the schools in both aspect in uh, infrastructure one building uh, retrofitting and their part planning and that that way also and another one is they also taking action in the some of the very sensitive issues in uh, what's uh, in a schools going on like harassment bullying they also have action to be um, taken in that uh, uh, in that in our program so that is our experience uh, in uh, our uh, one of the uh, best practices and also we have to uh, use a different uh, network, uh, children's network, you know, as Savinaji already mentioned, they are all, we are also working the child club and other uh, child group. Uh, they have mentioned the various name in the school activities. So we also, uh, we also train them and we also aware them regarding their uh, safety, uh, safety of the school, you know, and safety of the school. And at the same time, safety, uh, how to protect the, their call, uh, their friends and their their junior uh, from the kinds of violation, every kinds of violation. So th that can be approached. We have to uh, reply in our project as well. So another, uh, the last one. So how do we scale up uh, that uh, CSS master plan? Uh, is like uh, we need to reinforce 
because uh, sometimes people are forget, you know, you know that in Nepal, the when the earthquake has happened and all the people are very afraid, all the people are talking about that. After the two to three uh, years, they forget about that, you know, the, what's going, what's happened in the Nepal actually when the earthquake has happened. So we need to time to time reinforce that CSS master plans as well. If we reinforce the master plan, then then the you know like uh, in some of the schools there is a lack of staff in Palika, lack of resources, and so if we reinforce that CSS master plan, then then um, then the local people or head teacher or teacher they can be uh, think about and feel feel it that they their own. Uh, their own responsibility and so they can have to make uh, develop their plan of action and they really need they really uh, like implement in the field level so we really need to that uh, CSS master plan time to time uh, reinforce that in all level in a, a provincial level in a central level in local level and school level so uh, that is uh, we found in our uh, previous uh, program as well so another one is we uh, really need to be focused or prioritize that pillar three uh, because we heavily we can talk about the pillar one and uh, two but three is uh, uh, they can talking uh, they can talk about but um, there's not a prioritize you know so we really need to be prioritized the uh, pillar three as well so our uh, yes of course the building is also important. But uh, at the same time, there is a lot of sensitive issues uh, among the uh, students, children, and also the parents, you know. So we really need to be focused and prioritize that uh, sensitive issue to uh, make our children uh, uh, safety from both sides, you know, infrastructure, building, and other, and also same time uh, protection as uh, like uh, we can uh, violence against children uh, so we can protect them. Uh, so if we, uh, uh, we if we do the as a holistic approach, uh, uh, so our children uh, can learn a very very uh, good environment in a both sides, and they have also have to chance they improve their quality education uh, in the children and as well as the school as well. So uh, that's only my some of the notes what we uh, um, what we have to done in our previous. Uh, uh, program and also some of the things what we feel and what we gap in that when we during our program period. So uh, that's all. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jyoti, for highlighting your experience. And um, you know, you noted that um, although there is basic level of awareness among many of the stakeholders, the deeper understanding of what is in the CSSMP. Um, you know, they might not have that full understanding so that deeper knowledge is uh, quite important to actually implement the plan. And we really need that simplified master plan so that their uptake is easier uh, for them to encourage them to apply that. The, you also noted that children uh, involving children in their own school safety is quite important. And you also recently noted that how to in reinforce, um, you know, the the implications of disasters and the need necessity for being prepared and having this plan uh, implemented is quite important because as you noted in the example of the earthquake, the people easily tend to forget. So we'll be coming back to um, some of your thoughts and comments for all the other, from the, all the other panelists as well. Uh, I wanted to quickly check in if um, there were any uh, questions or comments. I also kindly request the panelists to scroll through the chat. There have been a few comments which might be of interest. Um, let me just take a look. Okay. Uh, so there's a question uh, for Sabina G on how might the provincial level government government's role develop for greater effectiveness of these efforts. Um, so I'll just uh, summarize some of the comments and then uh, direct some of the questions to the speakers as well. If uh, any of the participants would like to either put their questions on the chat box or raise their hand to, to speak, please uh, do so now. 
I have my hand raised, so I'm going to unmute myself and just make a comment. I know uh, being the facilitator <laughs> moderator is um, a breathtakingly hard uh, position <laughs> to be in. You're multitasking <laughs> incredibly. So I'm going to give you a little space to do what you're doing, and I just want to uh, reiterate and support Jyoti Ji's uh, statement that Pillar 3 often gets the short shift. Um, and Pillar 3 uh, investing in disaster uh, reduction and resilience education is so critically important. It is our long-term investment. Um, we're investing in our children's knowledge uh, of hazards and of risk reduction, and we are changing society in the process. Um, and if we short shift pillar three, we wind up with yet another um, generation that doesn't understand um, the risks that they may face, especially the risks that are um, happen at longer um, time scales than, than memory, which as Jyoti G points out is actually remarkably short. Um, it's two or three years. Uh, and um, in assessing schools post um, Gorka earthquake, uh, one of the things that uh, was really notable is that in many of the safer schools that had been constructed or retrofitted in the previous decade, um, all of the children and the parents that had been involved in that project uh, were no longer part of that school. Uh, the children had grown up and, um, and moved on and a new batch of children and students were involved and they did not remember why the school was built um, safely, how it was built safely, why uh, different uh, risk reduction elements were added. Um, and when they had gone for building a new block, uh, they hadn't incorporated uh, risk reduction techniques and earthquake safety techniques because they didn't have that uh, institutional and community memory. Um, and I would really advocate that we make sure that when we're building safer schools, that we leave the schools visually telling their own story. I would love it if every earthquake uh, ring beam on a safer school hat was in bright maybe orange or some fun color, and it said earthquake ring beam right and right across it so that um, the memory of what had been done remained longer uh, than the students and the parents who had been directly involved in that project. Yeah, thank you, Rebecca, for jumping in and also giving me a little bit of a breather. And I think that's a great segue into some of the comments and questions that are um, coming up. Um, so maybe just following up on that, Jyotiji, maybe uh, would you like to share your thoughts on, um, you know, how to um, keep it consistent, how to keep this memory alive uh, and get the sustained attention and efforts between disasters. There's also a comment from Vijayji from Asman uh, on how to incorporate indigenous uh, knowledge as well. And your thoughts on what Rebecca just mentioned as well. Jyotiji, would you like to, um, you know, share your, your perspectives on that and perhaps also, um, you know, address any of the questions from the guiding questions as well. Thank you. Jyotiji, you are uh, muted. Can you hear me? Yeah, I think Jyoti is muted. Um, okay. And then I'm I would sorry, like to... sorry, uh, my net is not so good, so uh, 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 yeah. Maybe one can, question? Yeah. Sure, I can uh, quickly summarize. So uh, you might have heard Rebecca, uh, you know, emphasize your point of how the memory between the disasters are short-lived and, you know, the question that comes to our mind is how do we sustain such attention efforts between disasters? Um, if you would like to comment on that. And also there's a question or a comment from in the chat box from Vijayji on 
how to incorporate indigenous knowledge as well. So if you would like to reflect on these points, Jyotiji, you're more, most welcome. And also there's a question on how to, you know, bring on board the private schools for CSSS yes, yes, in yes, action. Yes. That's why, yeah, we are uh, like Revika and then the BJZ has uh, the question. Uh, I don't have any uh, depth uh, like uh, answer on that because she's right. Every time we have to uh, new bats and uh, we work with them uh, two to uh, one to two years and then we another bats. So that's why I'm uh, raising that things like uh, reinforcement is a very important in all level, in a school level, in all level. So that is uh, one thing so we really need to do. Uh, even though CSS master plan is very big, and even the, as mentioned, the Revika that uh, uh, Pilat three is a very very hard to tough. But we try our best to reinforce and reinforce, and then time and time again we can uh, provide them awareness and uh, like orientation, so uh, that can be helped. I think so. That's all. And uh, I, I, and then <clears throat> as BJC said, uh, we really need to. Uh, small small issues and share with the local people and uh, local uh, bodies so that can be a uh, very helpful to work together uh, i think so and like uh, several i think we are every time uh, we are only talking about the uh, government school and community school we really need to be how to we uh, invite that uh, private school uh, in Kathmandu i think in mo most of the uh, city area, the schools, especially the private school is a very, very vulnerable, uh, you know, building. They have to hire, uh, they have to rent it. Uh, most of them is a rented, uh, uh, rented uh, building. So uh, we really think about uh, that and we really uh, to, uh, uh, we also invite the private school uh, on board in our uh, you know, like in that coalition or uh, coalition, uh, maybe the in education cluster as well, so we can uh, do that together. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Jyotiji, for, for your thoughts on that. And uh, we have another question um, on, uh, on the chat box from Naranji on, on the private schools. And then there's also a comment on how Papson can also be invited into the planning sessions. Um, now going on to um, Sabina Ji, I think just uh, you know combining a few of the questions and following up again, uh, you also mentioned how networking you know, is quite important and working with different organizations is important in your presentation. So uh, just a thought on how the provincial level government uh, role can be developed for greater effectiveness of these efforts. Um, perhaps you can also reflect on how to bring on private schools on board or the indigenous knowledge aspect. Uh, would you like to share your thoughts on that? Uh, thank you, Kanchan. Uh, Kanchan. I think, uh, yeah, I, I team because it's a, these are very huge systemic questions which we have not been Sorry, my videos are on, which we have not been able to, um, I think, adequately address so far. Uh, agreeing with all the comment made earlier, I think provincial level uh, uh, engagement, because with the three tier of the government, I, I guess uh, federal level is there, local level is quite active, and federal level is in between. All, uh, all, and we have um, reached them out uh, while we were discriminating comprehensive school safety minimum package, implementation guideline, it's a strategy in order to information label. But the, they are not the one who will be, uh, you know, uh, have the resources to implement things. So as a reckoning force, we can keep educating them. And if they can, uh, um, uh, because local government are the independent body and they get resources directly from the federal level. So these are, uh, but I think uh, engagement is important. We have to have the participation out there, even whether they will. So it's not only resources that you need in terms of monitoring fund, in terms of, um, in terms of uh, 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 monitoring the indicators, in terms of gui providing guidance that has to be there. But Helena has also mentioned that 
there is a huge uh, turnover everywhere, not only in the government, in, in the US system. I'm here at 28 years, doesn't mean that everybody's here. So there we don't have the strategic, I think, um, intervention to ensure that how systematically this thing can be penetrated. And comprehensive school safety minimum package was just an uh, implementation guideline was just developed in 2019. And then uh, pandemic happened. So we were not able to really go back like that way. And, but I'm happy to see some of the action. But our experience working with um, uh, Asman Nepal in Tarai districts, uh, with NSET and again in previous, uh, if, if you have the continued dialogue, this can be uh, done. But things are happening in a you know, project wise manner. So some strategic thinking on how do we engage with this networking uh, organization, including the, uh, uh, including the different level of government tires is important. And uh, from and also, um, uh, I think agency working and the, there has been greater uh, engagement with the provincial level. But the, I think challenge I see that they, they don't have a separate education uh, ministry. The social development ministry is the responsible for you know different kind of uh, service sector um, uh, program intervention. So that that is also another challenge how how to do it. So I guess we are still in transition. This needs more focused discussion, and uh, but some actions. And in regard of uh, uh, private schools, I think everybody has talked a lot. Uh, it's like uh, they were involved while developing the comprehensive school safety minimum package or implementation guideline. They were involved, but what we have realized, they were not enthusiastically involved to the extent because it demands a certain kind of commitment from the private sectors, which I think is challenging for them to fulfill. So, so uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's an open question, you know, in terms of providing information, uh, sharing guidelines, they are there, but something that has to be um, adhered by them, it's quite challenging, it would be quite challenging. So unless the reinforcement mechanism is stronger enough, not in terms of negative thing, but how do we uh, ensure that, you know, their premises, and it's not only question of the safe school or building, it's the whole question of the, uh, the protection aspect that happens in the private school. That needs also needs to be addressed. So I, I see that only, I think possible solution would be greater engagement, which we have not been able to do it, that we have to agree on. Uh, even they are the member of cluster, uh, Nepal education cluster, but the, there is not active participation and it's not a blaming game, but I think there's other priorities. So maybe it requires a little bit of strategic and uh, concentrated approach uh, to engage in this area. Over to you, Kanchan. Thank you, Sabina. I think uh, really, as you highlighted, that uh, incentives for participation can be difficult, uh, you know, drawing that attention uh, because it requires that long-term sustained effort from the different stakeholders as well it can be quite tricky. Um, I see a hand raised um, by um, Helen. If you would like to introduce yourself and share your thoughts. Rebecca, I also see your hand up. I'm not sure if, if this is the second time you're raising it or uh, you'd like to go as well. But first I will let Helen uh, speak. Helen, please uh, introduce yourself and share your thoughts. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm the country director at World Education. And I've been involved in the education cluster since the late 90s and have been through a number of different disasters. And it, as, as Jyoti mentioned and Sabina, you know, people are very active after an earthquake or very active when there's a flood and then they forget. Two or three years, all new people come and we have to start over. I think the most important thing is annual planning exercises and, and involving the new people to retain capacity and ensuring that those annual planning exercises need to be done at the provincial level and at the, at the municipality level so that there is actually um, ownership by those local bodies. And if you have province two, for example, your floods affect multiple uh, local government units, multiple districts often. So involving them in a, in a sort of a, a collaborative planning process, I think is really essential. And I think that that's, um, one way of doing that. I do think too that there needs to be more effort to build the capacity in those provincial government units around retrofitting and these kind of um, school safety um, technical issues because that, that knowledge disappears quite quickly. And I think there needs to be an ongoing process until it's really strongly embedded. Otherwise, a lot of the lessons learned will be forgotten and 
when the next, next earthquake comes, we won't be ready. So just a few thoughts from my side. Yeah, thank you, Helen. I think uh, you mentioned about how to integrate it into annual planning so that it is not forgotten and it becomes part and parcel of um, you know, regular planning cycles. Um, so thank you for that comment. And uh, Rebecca, I see your hand up. I also wanted to ask you, you know, what could be, what are some of the best practices perhaps from other countries that may be applicable to be applicable in Nepal? Uh, where there's a gap in Nepal, and if you have any reflections on any comments that have been made recently also, please go ahead. Sure. There's been a couple comments. Vijay um, asked about Indigenous knowledge, and I think that is so valuable and important for us to constantly remember that um, we have multiple issues going on. Um, if we're taking a multi-hazard approach, there are everyday hazards, um, there are um, annual or, or decadal hazards that we need to be worrying about, such as flooding. Um, landslides fall into that one as well. And then we have these longer term um, risks, climate change and earthquakes. And knowledge sits in different places. When we're talking about everyday hazards, the people we need to be talking to are the children themselves. Um, and the parents and the teachers, they have a very strong knowledge of what their hazards are in everyday context. Uh, when we're talking about local hazards that happen fairly frequently, um, an outside agency, an outside technical expert has no idea and we shouldn't even be asking them. It's really local people who understand those issues very, very well and we need to respect and draw out that local knowledge. Um, at the same time, uh, local people can't ha um, typically have knowledge of events that happen um, on the scale of um, multiple decades. If earthquakes happen every 50 years, if climate change happens unprecedentedly, um, that's something we need to be bringing in um, knowledge and experience from across the globe and crowdsourcing what is working uh, and bring that to um, local communities and saying, this is something you don't deal with regularly, but hey, look, this is what's worked over in the Philippines, or this is what's worked over um, in another place. What do you think? Um, how can we uh, contextualize it here? Um, in terms of best practices, uh, one thing that I've seen, uh, I'll bring two examples. In the Philippines, Plan International does quite a bit of the safer school construction um, and retrofitting, and they actively involve children and parents in that process. Nepal does this very well as well, uh, but uh, specifically in the Philippines, uh, children are given checklists of what makes a school safe in terms of the construction process. Um, and these checklists are based upon the cognitive and educational levels of the children uh, for very young children. Um, it's pictorial with uh, smiley faces and frowny faces. And then for older children, uh, it's much more detailed. And they have the children actively involved in monitoring the construction site, not because monitoring of the construction site should be left to children and parents and teachers. That's an abdication of responsibility. Um, by the donors um, and project managers, but rather because construction in the education sector is an education opportunity. Um, so that has been really successful there. Uh, uh, the minimum package is really promoting uh, safety, um, uh, children's involvement in identifying hazards. Uh, and I would highly, highly just encourage you to keep going in that um, regard. In Armenia, um, the children's safety clubs are uh, quite strong and the children engage in a hazard hunt uh, in their schools um, and are tasked with identifying what is it that makes this school unsafe for you. And they find things that, you know, the outside experts and the, even the parents and the teachers 
are not thinking about. Um, in one school that I, the children I talked with, they said they were terrified of the flower pots that were used to beautify the school because they were up high above the kids' heads as they were entering the school and they were afraid that those pots would fall down. Nobody else had thought of that idea. Uh, the children also noted that the sill beam, or I mean the uh, sill uh, for stepping over um, into the school had a little bit of a tiny little lip and they were constantly tripping on it. Um, and that the floors were very, very slippery. And when they were washed, the children would fall down. Uh, so they were able to bring these ideas to uh, the school committee and say, these are our hazards. Um, and sometimes it's those physical things. Sometimes when we talk to girls, it has nothing to do with the physicality, it has to do with whether or not there are private latrines and whether there are menstrual products available to them. Um, for boys in conflict areas, it can be uh, the walk to school and uh, the gang violence um, that uh, recruiting can happen and or um, the trafficking of children. So we really need to be talking uh, to all of our stakeholders, especially our students and our parents and our teachers about what it means to have a safe school. Um, and then another thing in the chat was about training. Yes, every time we train Masons, they gain a little bit of skill and they use that skill to either go to the urban centers and get a new job in Kathmandu or to even leave the country. And that they take that training and they run with it, which is, which is great and creates a brain drain in the local community. So what do we do about that? Um, we need to work really hard on this issue and I don't think I have pat answers, but I have a couple ideas to throw out. One of which is we need to be sure we're training not only the Masons, but the people who will replace the Masons, which is probably the day laborers. Um, and we need to be training the people who will be most likely to stay uh, in the communities. And that might not be the men, it might be the women. So we need to be really thinking about our gender balance in terms of our Mason training. Um, but we also need to scale up and think about training of Masons not as a site specific issue of, oh, we're gonna build a school, let's train some Masons here. Uh, but thinking about that strategically at the country level and incorporating um, hazard resistant construction training into um, technical school content, um, into apprenticeship and certification programs. And every Thursday, um, several of us at NSET and I um, uh, meet up and we think about these issues and we're, we're formulating some ideas. Stay tuned. Um, but we need to get more strategic about this. Yes, um, thank you, Rebecca. Especially, I think the best practices from the two countries were quite interesting both uh, the children monitoring the, the construction process as a learning opportunity, opportunity and also the hazard hunt. I think other comments also reflected that that sounds quite interesting. Also in the video that Amy shared earlier, you know, it talked about how um, the whole school approach needs to think about all the different aspects that we might not have thought about and the children has a very, children and students have a very unique perspective, including small pebbles or rocks or a flower pot or the slip, you know, slippery floor. So I think that really brings the, the context of the whole school approach to safety and why it is so important that we, we look from different perspectives as well as, um, you know, in terms of the longevity of these approaches that are sustaining in the, uh, for many, many years to come. And also you commented about how to not only train the Masons, but also their replacements and also gender balance becomes quite important. In one of the projects that I was involved in, um, you know, when the trainings were ongoing, we trained uh, not just uh, the, the selected, uh, you know, caretaker, um, but also their replacement backup caretaker, just in case they, they moved or traveled for a few days. 
So those become quite important as we we plan, but it definitely takes a lot of investment um, in, in, you know, making sure that it's effective. Um, yeah, I just want to check in um, with the participants now if they have any uh, final questions or feedback, their comments going back and forth a little bit in, in the comment box, but uh, no specific questions as yet. But uh, participants, if you would like to raise your hand, just come in quickly because we're coming towards the, the end of the session. And I would like to give the next few minutes to our panelists for their final thoughts. So do I see any, any hands or questions? Let's see. Yeah. Okay. Um, there's one question from Binaji. Would you like to uh, unmute yourself and ask the question? And please introduce yourself as well. Bina, Bina Khadka, are you able to hear me? Sorry, I had my mic muted for a second. Zoom let me know that I was muted. Um, so Binaji, you're also muted, so we could not hear you. But just to reiterate her question to the panelists, how to broaden CSSMP in all the local levels, what could be the strategy? And you know that is very closely related to the guiding questions of this uh, panel discussion as well. Like, how do we overcome roadblocks to schools understanding CSSMP requirements, what are some of the best practices, and we heard a few today, and what requires the most support for proper implementation, and we heard a lot about how knowledge and education uh, and sustained efforts in these aspects become important. But uh, if uh, now panelists would like to just reflect on any of these questions, or what has been said today, I would like to give each of the panelists two minutes to, to reflect on these uh, questions. Um, so first, I would like to request Jyoti Ji to, to go first um, as, as her final remarks for this panel discussion. I don't have so much, but I really want to thank to all of you and mainly the organizer. And uh, after all discussion that, uh, yes, of course, this is a very uh, not so tough issues, but uh, we can uh, work together and we can also the, have a good strategy to have, uh, uh, including all levels and even the both uh, uh, schools, uh, private schools as well. So uh, that's all. So we do together uh, these things for all over the Nepal schools and safety for the, our children. Thank you. Thank you, Jyoti Ji, for your uh, remarks. Now, may I request uh, Sabina Ji for her uh, final thoughts and comments, um, any reflection on the guiding questions or what has been said in the chat box or by other panelists? Thank you, Kanchan, and thank you, everybody, for this uh, valuable comments. Uh, well, these questions are very, very important one, but had we have this uh, been able to work it, it would have been wonderful. Uh, this um, um, working in comprehensive school safety has been a long journey, and knowing the past vulnerability, I think we started this discussion uh, when the Kosi flood started 2008, and here we have finally in 2009, um, you know, 18, uh, the CSSMP has um, been developed. 
and so it's a long journey we learned whatever we started to apply it you know um, that was there and and the good part was that um, as a cluster partners um, um, and our development partners we all uh, even uh, came together to strengthen it after 2015 earthquake so we see some very very radical uh, uh, changes in the policy documents, but this policy documents needs to be implemented um, at the school level into, and how this will phase out. This, this itself is a very, very challenging process, but I think this again takes time uh, taking into, and when, when I'm saying take time, I'm not trying to sigh away from the work, but I think looking at the transition of the uh, situation where we are in uh, the federal situation, you know, federalism, it's a civil transitioning and the, the document envision a very, very strong uh, governance uh, uh, component that it will take over. So I, I would say that it's, it's a lot of work. We have to do it together. The whole idea is to uh, disseminate it nationwide. And this is cannot be done from the federal level with the provincial level, then provincial level will be designated to uh, um, all the local palika level. In some places where we have this, like uh, in 14 earthquake districts that we, we did that, some some districts, palika, uh, other partners are doing it, like um, Safer School Project is doing it uh, also. So this also need a good mapping out and see that actually who is covering what and how other, as I have been talking about targeting, phasing out, how can we support government to take it forward? So that is one thing I was thinking. Uh, also, the very agreeing with the uh, behavioral kind of uh, change aspect that uh, to ensure by the school community, by the teachers, school head teacher, um, uh, the, and the student and involving the community, how can we make it a regular practice that, that, that we don't panic, but be prepared. I think that information is very, very important to, um, um, and take away misses uh, for all of us. And uh, I, I um, think that we are progressing, but the pandemic has dealt because we were really looking forward to do a, some very, very uh, good work uh, with the local palikas uh, uh, to uh, you know, operationalize the minimum uh, uh, package. But this and uh, school not being open physically that raised a lot of questions, but we never dreamt that there would be pandemic where there is not a physical facility and children would be equally uh, vulnerable in the school setting, and that is more psychosocial support, as the, um, um, Jyotiji has been mentioning, uh, Devika has been mentioning about uh, those kind of information, how do we feed them, that also needs uh, uh, another layer of looking at things. So this comprehensive school safety is, I agree when Jyotiji said, is, it looks like complex, but this is something actually we have come together, agree on as a broader from the broader discussion with the development partners how do we simplify and how this gets contextualized i think this depends depends on a lot of capacity building um, uh, um, of uh, the local government as well as the provincial government to follow up on this so with this i really would like to thank you the organizers for this opportunity and uh, um, i hope it would have been really wonderful to have this presentation in the uh, comprehensive school safety thematic working group so that the government is not present here and they can be equally hearing that what could be the uh, step forward in, in case where we have normal situation in case where we have pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, Sabina Ji, for your uh, comments and remarks and really, you know, highlighting some of the issues that we continue to face and, uh, you know, hopefully as different organizations work together and engage with the government that some of some of the the challenges that we face can be overcome and we heard some of the good practices today that can be taken up as well now moving on to our uh, panelist uh, dr pachi green maybe you would like to share your final thoughts and comments uh, and you know reflect on any of the comments that are coming up on the chat box as well uh, thank you. This has been an absolutely uh, wonderful conversation. Um, and I thank the other panelists and the uh, participants for um, thinking together. Uh, it, it's a good opportunity to bring these ideas forward. Um, the thing that I constantly come back to is the original uh, reason for comprehensive school safety as a framework is that we we're working in silos, that the engineers were working on school buildings, that the um, emergency managers and DMO was working on uh, drills, and that educators were off working on education. And um, there's a constant pressure for those uh, 
sectors and those spheres to separate and work in isolation. And we have to continuously uh, bring them back together. The really important work of comprehensive school safety comes in the overlaps uh, between um, these pillars. Uh, and a lot of that work is multi-decadal um, work that we've been discussing. You can't do it in a single project. You can't do it with a single community. Um, you have to do it over and over and over again uh, to achieve cultural change. Um, and I want to leave with the school that haunts me. Many schools haunt me, but one that in particular that haunts me is one from Nepal um, that was retrofitted, uh, done quite well um, from a technical standpoint, uh, but done in isolation, uh, pillar one only uh, without uh, pillar two and three without any thought to emergency management um, plans and drills and without any thought for education. Um, and I spoke with students, teachers and staff after the 2015 earthquake. Uh, the building itself was fine, it, no damage whatsoever. Uh, but when I talked to the teachers and students, they said that they didn't trust the building because they thought of it as some sort of external project from some big donor um, that was in their minds full of corruption and meaningless. Uh, and they didn't trust the building. And so when I asked the teachers, well, what would you have done if the earthquake had happened actually during uh, school hours? And they said, well, we would have told the children to run and jump off the balconies. Um, so a safe school physically, uh, but an unsafe school because of that lack of cultural change and that lack of uh, integrating all three pillars. So let's continue, bring these pillars together, continue at the thematic platform level, at the provincial, at the district, Polyka level, to bring these uh, pillars together and be talking and working together long term. Thank you, Rebecca, for sharing that example. And I think that is what Sabina G was also talking about in the very beginning about bringing all these pillars uh, becomes so important. And that's a real life example of how, um, you know, how it can play out if we don't do that. So I'm sure it will also now haunt many of us as well um, as you shared that story. Um, thank you so much. No, as you said, we had a very interesting discussion from uh, the participants, from the panelists. Thank you so much, panelists, for you know sharing your deep knowledge and experience today with us, and really um, you know putting it concisely for all the participants for us. To, to think uh, for a long time, to take it forward as well. And we hope to see you tomorrow for the second session on retrofitting an earthquake safe uh, building for schools, scaling solutions at the same time. Um, again, thanking for your time uh, and active participation today. I would now like to welcome Leela once again to provide our closing remarks. And this is a goodbye from me as well. And I thank uh, Amy for her support and all the organizers for putting together this session. Thank you and over to you, Leela. Okay, thanks so much, Manchin. Um, I just wanna echo uh, to everybody that it's been a real pleasure to be a part of NSSP. I think it was a great project. It was very interesting um, and it addressed a lot of issues uh, that came up in a very, I think, agile and, and, and manner that was able to, to shift as um, our environment shifted over the course of the pandemic. So really interesting project. Uh, I wanna thank all of you for agreeing to be to participate um, and to be part of this. I know many of us have been on lots of Zoom um, sessions and sometimes it's a bit overwhelming, but uh, thank you for the great discussion, for participating. 
Uh, I, of course, echo um, Kanchan that we have sessions all week at the same time. Um, so please do pick and choose the ones that could be interesting for you and participate in them and feel free to share uh, the invite amongst your networks. Uh, another big thank you to our panelists, uh, Sabina G and Jyoti G and Rebecca. Thanks. I know this is a terrible time for you, but we very much appreciate all of your inputs and it's really nice to, to see you again after all this time. Um, thanks again, Kanchan. You were great today. Um, Amy and Jemima for all of the logistics behind getting this set up. I know it was a lot and it's really gone well, so thank you for that. Um, and I'd like to thank, of course, our participants from SCDO who have supported us through this project. So we hope to see all of you um, again uh, tomorrow and for the next, for the rest of the week and our in the rest of our sessions. Uh, and that's it for me for today. Thank you. Thanks again. Thank you, everyone. Um, and there will be a link uh, on the chat box for the next sessions. And as Lila mentioned, it's the same time the, for the rest of the week. So please do come back for the other sessions. And as well as the links for the recordings of the sessions will also be shared uh, later. Um, so thank you again for your valuable time and your rich discussions. Thanks, everyone.